Listen, we're we're beginning some challenges. We're we're going to be starting two services on, and uh, some of you wonder sometimes why you don't see certain people at church. It's because if everybody showed up here on a Sunday morning, everybody that calls Crosswalk Church home, and they, they actively come. Now we we consider actively coming like once every six months. No, once once every maybe. You know, year. Uh, but if you uh, they actively come, we couldn't seat everybody in the sanctuary, even with the kids back in children's church. So we got some interesting times coming up here. But but something has been laid on my heart, and and it's it's basically this: it's that the church is to return to the Word of God. Do you see that? I believe that that. W- People sitting in the chairs, the pastors, the church leaders have fallen away from the one thing that will sustain them in life. And that one thing is this awesome book right here. The B-I-B-L-E. Now the Bible says that that this is a two-edged sword. It cuts to the front and it cuts to the back. And goes all the way to the soul. Folks, if you're going to live in this world, this is the only book that will sustain you in life. Now, you may read uh, all the other authors, Christian authors, and you may read and get assistance on studying this. But ultimately, this is the book that is going to sustain you in life. Can I get an amen out of that? Praise the Lord. So as we go through this journey, I said last week, I made a statement last week. I said if you don't interact with the Bible, that that basically you are going to be a dumb Christian. And that was the terminology I used. Now after receiving death threats and and you you are like Christian people wouldn't threaten you. Oh, boy. <laughs> Amen. You, they wouldn't threaten me because I carry. That's why, you know, I got, got the 30. You, you all ain't following along. Yeah. Some of you thought that was funny. The rest of you are already going to sleep. Uh, but the, the, basically what is happening in the church today, this church and every other church, is we are producing dumb Christians. Because we're not, we don't have the desire to get in the Word of God. We don't know what God said about anything because we're waiting for somebody, a pastor, or we're waiting for a teacher or a church leader or somebody to come along and tell us. Well, I want to tell you something this morning. I will not take anybody's word on this until I have read it for myself. You see, because I want to know does the Word of God say that? So, so I thought about this thing, and I wanted to put it into perspective. Now, is anybody in here scuba dive? Everybody ever been scuba diving? Claudia is. I see Tiffany. I got. Is anybody certified scuba divers? Are you sure? Any nobody's. We got to get out more, people. Either that, or you all are nervous now. Nervous because this is Harnett County and they consider mud slinging scuba diving. So you, <laughs> right? Praise the Lord. But in scuba diving, did you know that there's an amount of equipment that they need to to go scuba or not need, but they have to go scuba diving? I learned a couple of things this week. Now I learned that if the water is colder than 75 degrees. They've got to have a different suit. They need a different barometer, or and they need a different temperature gauge. And if it's hotter than 75, they've got to have something different. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Did anybody else know that? Mr. Ted did. I, mean, I would have figured my medical personnel would have, would have known that. So I've got one that knew that. I didn't know that. And I also learned that in scuba diving, did you know how much equipment they have? They have a mask so they can see. Now, I was told that if you get a good mask, that a good mask can help you. It doesn't matter what temperature of the water, that you can use one mask. Uh, they have wetsuits. They have weights that they put on to hold them down. They're not like me. Or maybe they are like me because, see, I float up. My, my hind end, it, you, you all don't fat floats. You, 
Braxton, we put Braxton in the pool, and Julie puts that life preserver on her, on him. And I'm like, why are you worried about that? He just, he floats back up. His little, little rear end comes up out of the water. But they have, they have dive watches, snorkels, fins, weight systems, dive lights, signaling devices, diving bags, wetsuits, and even more equipment that they probably don't even really need. But out of all that equipment, Pastor Gordon, did you know there's only one piece that enables them to sustain themselves under the water to be able to stay under there for more than a few minutes and seconds at a time? How many of you know what that is? Say it loud and proud. Oxygen. I'm not going to make you sing on one leg. I mean, come on. Oxygen. They need oxygen. That means they've got all of this equipment on them, and they're ready for sharks with guns and spears and all of this stuff, and there's only one thing that sustains them under the water. Oxygen. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute because I'm going to read out of 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, reading there two verses, 16 and 17. That's six, uh, 2 Timothy Chapter 3, I'm excited about presenting God's Word this morning. If you're not excited to be here, I'm excited to present it to you because I know this Word fairly well. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and verse 17. So you all just told me that the diver, now am I correct on that, Mr. Ted? They, they have to have oxygen to sustain them under the water. Now, whether that's on a tank or that's an oxygen line or whatever it is, they have to have air, oxygen. So if that be true, how many of you in here would attempt to go diving in 30 feet or deeper water without oxygen? Is there anybody would try that? You, you wouldn't try that because do you know what would you? Not in 30 feet of water. You never make it to the bottom. Well, now, we're not talking about five feet of water, Samantha. We're talking about going down to 30 feet of water and being able to breathe down there all the way down and all the way up. Some of you are thinking, could I hold my breath that long? How long would it take me? Now, what happens? What happens if, if you have a lack of oxygen? Mr. Ted, you, you tell us. You begin to get... So confusion, right? You get confused, and then basically, basically you go brain dead, right? You, you following along? Because this is going to be a real good point here in a minute. Why would you go into the waters of life and try to make it in this life, being tempted and pressed by the devil without the one thing that sustained you in this life? Why would you go through life? Because guess what happens when you try to do it? You become brain dead. You become confused. You become stressed. You become all of these things. You become brain dead. You see, Paul is going to give us some instructions to give us some oxygen. Not so that we can wade into the water a little bit and go snorkeling. So that we can go right into the middle of it and we can breathe and know that God is control, in control of every situation. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, all scripture, everybody say all scripture, is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable. Everybody say profitable. Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works Pastor Brandon how about I ask God's blessing over this word Amen. So here is our oxygen. Here's the tank. 
And Paul says that all Scripture, all Scripture. Now, if you read the American Standard Version, the American Standard Version says that all Scripture given by God is profitable, which basically all Scripture is given by God. You, are y'all following along with me? Now, the atheists and agnostics and Gnostics and all those other crazy groups, and they say that this was written by flawed men. How many of you believe that this was written by flawed men? Oh, anybody want to raise your hand on that one? You, now, Elisha's with me. Pastor Elisha's with me. Dana's going to jump in because Pastor Elisha did. Pastor Brandon, he's not sure yet. He's, he's waiting. He's holding out. Because, you know, he did admit that he likes to take credit for everything after it's done. So, so when I tell him that Pastor Elisha's right, he's going to say, look at Dana and say, see, I told you so. Amen. Praise the Lord. This was written by flawed men. It was. I, I will tell you Peter was a flawed man. I will tell you Moses was a flawed man. But I want you to know this morning that it was written by flawed men under the inspiration of a perfect spirit. That the Holy Spirit gave men unction to write this book right here under the impression that it was for God. It was for God, by God. God delivered this word to you. So they can say that it was written by flawed men. It was. Flawed men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, all Scripture is profitable to man. See, all Scripture, that means that if you're in the Old Testament, how many of you know that the Bible's got two Testaments? The Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament has kind of been thrown away a little bit. Nobody wants to use that anymore. But I will tell you that the Old Testament still applies today. That you can look in Leviticus and find the answers to your problem. I believe that you can look in Joshua and find the answers to your problems. Because Paul said all Scripture is profitable for man. Folks, right here is your answer. If you're going swimming in the deep end, you might want to take this with you. Now, that's figuratively speaking. I don't want to see any of you drown in your Bibles later in the pool. But this is your sustainer. This is your oxygen. Now that we, we said that, the, the question goes back to you. Why would you go swimming? Or why would you go scuba diving without your oxygen? Would you do it? No, because you're going, to be, you're going to be brain dead. Because, see, the, the, Bible has, the Bible has a function in your life. You know, it's kind of like the man that says, I'm broke. And he goes and robs a bank. How much sense does that make? I'm broke. So, therefore, I'm going to go rob a bank. Now, if you go rob a bank, I'm not going to feel sorry for you. Right? And we know that's wrong because of the Bible. But I'm not going to feel sorry for you if you go to rob a bank and you get put in prison unless you pay tithes on that money, and then I'm going to be like, man, I wish we could have kept that. <laughs> Some of you are like, he's telling the truth. But this is your sustainer. This is your God. You don't make stupid decisions. Can I say stupid in church? There ain't kids in here that are going, don't repeat what I say. I'm terrible. But you'll make stupid decisions in life if you don't allow this to be your God. Why will you do that? Because you're brain dead. You're confused. You don't know what you're doing. The Bible has a function in your life. Let's talk about that function this morning. You want to talk about that for the next 20 minutes? Some of you are like, I just want out of here. You called me dumb. You see, listen. Do you know how good this book is right here in this wrapper? Not any, right? It does no good. Do you know how good this book is on the shelf holding up the rest of your books? It's no good. Think about this. With all the paramil paramilitary types we've got in here, how good is a gun 
without bullets. Now, cartridges, Kevin, just calm down. With, but I've got to explain it to everybody else. How good is a gun without bullets? What are you going to do with it, Adam? Are you going to throw it at somebody? I mean, right? If they're 100 yards away, it's kind of hard to throw a gun that far, Jason. I'm not that. I played a lot of ball in my life, but I'm just not that good. How good is the Bible if you never open it? Now, I realize Grandma knew everything. I realized that Grandma had life figured out. But Grandma telling you about the Word is different than you getting the Word for yourself. Because I'm going to tell you something. This is something you'll learn today, Madeline. I can read this. I can read one passage of Scripture. And I can go back in uh, six months and read that same passage of Scripture and God give me another interpretive meaning out of it. He applies it to the situation I'm in right then. Nothing against Grandma and her interpretation, but I believe the Holy Spirit leads you. So here's what the, the Bible functions as. Paul said that all Scripture given by God is profitable for man. What is it profitable for? He says it's profitable for doctrine. You ever thought about exactly what doctrine you subscribe to? If I said, what doctrine do you subscribe to? Some of you would say, well, I'm Baptist. I like to get out of church at 12 o'clock and go eat lunch. Some of you would say, I'm Pentecostal. I like to run, shout, jump, and holler. We don't really have any reason. We're meaner than the devil outside of the church, but we're full of his spirit on the inside. Some of you would say, I'm Methodist. I died a long time ago. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Somebody help me. I got to get back on track. The Bible is profitable for doctrine. Now, I like to utilize the Scripture, and you've heard me say this many times. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, when Luke is speaking about the thousands saved after the day of Pentecost, and upwards of probably 10,000 people, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Somebody tell me what doctrine that was. The apostles' doctrine. What were they ministering? Stick with your first answer there, Shana. They were ministering what? Jesus. Jesus came into the world. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. If you want to be saved, you need. That was their doctrine. All Scripture is profitable for man in doctrine. Now, I realize that we have 542,000 denominations. All about how man interprets the Bible. But at the end of the day, I believe it's all about the apostles' doctrine. Jesus came. Jesus died for your sins. And he rose again on the third day for you to have eternal life. Everything else I believe I got from this. And being guided by the Holy Spirit. So there are some things that, that I take to mean that, that others do not. You see, I believe in the Trinity. I believe that, that God is, the Godhead is made up of Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. One God, three different distinct personalities. Now, I believe that because I've read this. And if I didn't believe that, I'd become Jehovah Witness. You, you with me? See, I'd, I'd subscribe to the Jehovah Witness because they dress up nice on Saturdays. They have their whole Sunday to do nothing but eat chicken wings and watch football. They come out on Saturdays dressed up nice. or Because, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't be Mormon. Even though black makes you look skinny. You all don't know. You never, never seen the, never seen them riding their bi bikes in their black tie and black pants, white shirt. How do they stay clean with that white shirt riding that bike? You ever wondered about that? I do. If I didn't believe in the Trinity, if I didn't believe in the doctrine of the Word, I'd probably be Jehovah Witness. You see, it's good for doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus. 
And then Paul says in the scripture in Timothy, the Bible is good for reproof. How many of you know what that word means? Pastor Gordon, you be quiet. That's kind of a tough word, isn't it? I even had to go and look that up, in the, and I used the King James Dictionary. And then I used my own concordance. It means this, a scolding or a, or, or a rebuke. The Bible is profitable for all men because it's God's Word. It's profitable for doctrine, and it's profitable for reproof, scolding, and rebuke. Now, I'm going to tell you, here's how that fits in. You see, Jason, if you do something wrong, and you read it in the Bible, and you try to justify it being right, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes and lets you know. That is wrong. Now, why do you know it's wrong? Because it's in the Bible. You see, I, I, I love this terminology in Proverbs 15, 5. It says, a fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. How many of you got a whipping when you were young? Some of you are like, what? I wish they'd stop. Do you think your parents whipped you because it was fun? All right, now that I'm a parent, I realize that's true. That's, that, that whole saying this hurts me worse than it does you, that's a lie. Because it makes me feel a lot better. <laughs> but God whipped you because he loves you. He rebukes you and scolds you because he loves you. And you will take it. If the Bible says it's wrong, guess what it is? It's wrong. Anything else is compromising God's Word. Now, some of you say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, we, I, I get a lot of questions. You know, I could write my own book off of just the questions I, I get. And a lot of times what, what church people try to do is we, we try to write our own manual on what is right and what is wrong. You can't do this. You can do this. You can't do this. Well, folks, it's already been written. We don't have to make that manual. It's already been written. This is the God in your life. This is your oxygen. You see, we have social issues. Now, now I'm going to bring these out, and if you don't agree with me, don't, don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you. When I look in the Bible, I can see such things as adultery being a sin. I can see such things as, as uh, homosexuality as a sin. Now, I realize that we live in modern times and modern social environment, and the world tells us it's not applicable. It's only found in Leviticus. Now, does that mean that we are to hate anybody and we go out and we condemn them? That means that we need to use this word to purify ourselves and to wipe out all the sin ourselves, not in judgment, but to present the truth. Because, see, you, sometimes, you and I, feel like we need to defend this word. But here's the amazing thing. If I open it up, it defends itself. Y'all you, with me? It defends itself. So when I look at it and I say, hey, I don't believe in a homosexual marriage. It doesn't mean I'm condemning them. That means that the Bible tells me that, that it's a sin. I get the question. I get this question a lot. I always get the question, Pastor Ron, how do you feel about drinking? How do you, you don't drink... Not that you know of, anyway. I'm really an alcoholic on the side. You just don't know it. <laughs> but I get that question a lot. And you know what? I, I only answer it in private. You, you want to know why I only, I only answer that, that question in, in private? It's because uh, some, if I give my full, and if I give my full uh, interpretation of what the Bible says, some of you'd go out and get drunk tomorrow and tell everybody that Pastor Ron told you it's okay. 
Some of, some of the men are holding on to the end of your chairs going, please tell her it's all right. Please tell her. But when it comes to drinking, I personally, listen, I'll give you the full answer in private if you want to know, but I can tell you drunkenness is a sin. Did, y'all with me? I, I can tell you that, and that's not through it. That's using a literal interpretation uh, because the Bible says, uh, Paul says, hold on, I'll get there. Paul says in Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lavishness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you also in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, now understand, the full answer I give to you in private, but I can say what is a sin because the Bible tells me what's a sin. Is there anything to interpret there? Do you feel like you need to go and it, you, because the Bible says it? So therefore, the word is for reproof. But the word is for something else. And Paul says, yeah, it's good for, it's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for reproof. But it's profitable for correction. Now, I told you, some of you got, got whipped when you were younger. And now you parents just love to whip your children. But when you whip your children and you only scold them for the things that they did wrong without offering them the solution... You've only given them half of what you needed to give them. Now, my dad was real good at that. Those of you that met my dad know that he was real good at that. He would whip me, and then he'd say, you do it again, you're going to get it twice as bad. I didn't need to know what was right. I just needed to know what was wrong, you know. The Bible tells us how to correct our lifestyle. If you're, if you're involved in, in lavishness or greed, how do you correct it? You come back to the Lord. You repent of your sins. Now, you need to be careful because Hebrews 10, 26, for those that willfully commit sin, the blood no longer applies. Now, And that's what I personally subscribe to uh, because that's what the Word says. But the Word does say for correction. If you're not, uh, we're doing a study in our connect groups right now uh, about marriage. And yesterday it was about quality time uh how you need to spend quality time with your spouse and i thought oh boy i'm in trouble because julie's going to really bless me on this one he's always looking at the computer he's always on she always accuses me always being on facebook you know i just like i walk around just like now I, I don't have i don't have study that i have to do for my sermons i don't have school that i'm trying to finish my master's right now i don't have all of that stuff i just live on facebook yeah i know she she's she she still thinks that's the truth but we were talking about quality time and see did you know the bible tells us husbands and wives that we're to spend quality time with our spouse that's the corrective measure if you know there's a problem in your marriage, then you've got to do something about it. Guess what? This word tells you what to do. If you go out and you you commit a sin or you do something, the word tells you what you need to what you need to fix. Kind of like that scuba diver. Remember, we've been talking about that. That scuba diver said, huh, "I've got my air tanks." I've got my fins. I've got everything on. Because, you know, if, if they're like me, if you were like me and you picked up scuba diving tomorrow, you'd want to go out and look the part. See, when I step on the golf course, I look like a golfer. They don't know that I'm about to hit the ball straight into the woods. They look at me and they say, well, you know, he's kind of a big fella. So he put his weight behind it and that ball ought to go 400 yards. Oh, it does. I can smack a golf ball off that tee can and pass the brand. I can nail a golf ball off the tee. Some people have talked about how far I can hit that drive. The only problem, it might be straight into the woods or straight into the water. But when I get up to that tee, they say, he looks like he knows what he's doing. Because I got my visor on. I got my plaid shorts on. 
Got my nice collared shirt, usually with Tar Heels on it somewhere. Got my nice Adidas golf shoot. Don't I? I look sharp when I'm out there, don't I? I look like a professional. Tiger's got nothing on me. Rory McElroy ain't got anything on Pastor Ron. Because I looked the part. And then I smacked that T-ball, and everybody behind me is back there going, <laughs> look at the fat kid that can't play. But see, there's a corrective measure there. And the Bible helps us realize that there's more than just looking the part. You, you realize, Christians, you can't dress up on Sunday. Somebody mentioned about everybody was dressed up today. Everybody looked nice. And there is so many people in here look nice. But you realize you can't dress the part. You've got to follow the corrective measure of the B-I-B-L-E. And that's the book for all of us, right? So, so if it says that it's good for reproof, it's profitable for doctrine, it's profitable for reproof, it's profitable for correction. And then Paul goes a little bit further and he says that the man of God may be perfect. How many of you got confused when you read that? Is that up there? Put that up there for me, Anthony, one more time. I want to I want to look at I want you to see visually this scripture for a minute. So that man may be made perfect. How many of you in here are perfect? How many of you think you're perfect? It's me and Freddie. That's why we get along so well. <laughs> So you got to be asking yourself the question, how can you be perfect? Doesn't the Bible say that we all fall short of the glory of God? But is Paul referring to you and I being perfect? Or is he referring to you and I striving for perfection? Because you're never going to be perfect. You can read the Bible a month of Sundays, and you, are, you never are going to be perfect. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to strive to be like Christ. Christ, who was perfect. Look at that. See, this is, this is so easy. I make it so easy. A, B, C, or D. And all of them the same answer. And you get it. That's how I like to take tests. Tony is, I like, hey, never mind. Yo, he's not telling you to be perfect. He's telling you to strive to be like Christ. And you know how you get there? The Bible. How easy is that? that? That the man of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto good works. That means that when you read this, you'll realize that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man will never enter into the Father except through the Son. And you'll also realize that with that comes a set of works that are to be done. Because Christ did things while he's on the earth. Y'all know that, right? Contrary to popular belief, Christ did more than go to the beach and drive forwards. Because, you know, there's a whole lot of men here at the church that think Christ drove forwards. Hmm. He drove a Dodge. Don't ever blaspheme on the Lord like that. <laughs> You'll learn that Christ was busy doing things. And as I said last week, he wants us involved in those things. And those things are, guess where? Everybody's like, what you having for lunch? I don't know. I thought about Mexican. Mm, I ate that last week. <laughs> Don't worry, I war with that too. I'm, a lot of times, one of the pastors be preaching, and I'm thinking, wonder what I'm going to preach next week. How's, how's that work? You see, God is calling us for more, folks. And he's saying that, and Paul said, listen, the Bible is profitable for man and their doctrine, reproof, correction, and righteousness. 
You see that part of, that I just discussed about perfection? It's when we begin to work in righteousness. That is, we begin to work in the image of Christ. Now, I told you something last week, and I'm not sure you wrote this down and took this home with you. You don't have to walk up to anybody and tell them you're a Christian. Y'all with me? Just stay with me five more minutes. You don't have to walk up and tell anybody you're a Christian. They should already know it. Without you ever opening your mouth, would you ever throwing your hands up and throwing your legs out and dancing around and they should already know. Somebody told me here at the church, uh, it, it, I think it was Dominica, told me that how they got to this church was they had known somebody that was going here that cursed like a sailor and was always down in the dumps, and they said that they noticed something happened to that person. See, they got into the Word of God, and God transformed them. Not, not Pastor Ron. I didn't say, hey, you got to be like me, and you got to do the things I do. You got to look like me. You got to do all of that stuff. That's no and void. I opened up the Bible, and I showed them truth. And by doing that, truth transformed them. And somebody else said, hey, something must be going on, so let me come check it out. You see, that is what this does for you. This is that oxygen that when you get out in life and you feel like you're drowning, because let's be honest, if we went around this room and we talked about the personal challenges that we have, we talk about the things that are coming against us, we'd say, man, I had no idea you were in that bad of shape, Pastor Ron. Or I didn't know, Nicole, that you were going through those things. We all feel like we're drowning sometimes. We all feel like we can't get a breath. Guess where we can go and get it? Guess where we can go? And I'm not talking about opening up that daily devotional and saying, oh, that was, that was sweet. That word was sweet today. I just love it. It encouraged me so much. The Bible is just such a good book, and I love it. I'm going to give me some more of that devotional tomorrow. I'm talking about really cutting to the meat and the bones, man, getting down to the nuts and the joints of this thing so that God can supply us with that oxygen. Because every once in a while, you're going to come into the church, you're going to be feeling weak. You're going to be feeling tired, and you're going to be feeling in despair. And you're going to look at Pastor Ron or Pastor Brandon or Pastor Elisha, and you're going to say, help me. Help me. Pray for me. Pray for me, Pastor Ron. I love every one of you, and I pray for this church daily. Every day I go through prayer. But you know what? Right here is where you'll sustain yourself. There's not one thing I can do for you that'd be any better than what this does for you. Can you say amen to that? Praise the Lord. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to end this service different than I've ended most. You see, because I realized that this wasn't the jumping and running service, and this wasn't me me shouting at you and screaming at you, and this wasn't us breaking out oil and knocking anybody out. This was a word given by God for you to sink in, soak in, and absorb. Because here's the thing, folks. We're living in the last hours. You could say, I've heard that my whole life. I, don't, I don't really don't care. Really, if you don't believe it, I don't care because I've read Daniel. I've read the prophet's words. And Daniel, has his prophecy has all but been fulfilled. I've read Revelation. I've read Isaiah. And I know that we're living, not in the last days, we're living in the last hours of this world. 
I want you to know what you are doing here. I want you to know the adversity and the perversion of this that you're going to face. And if you don't know it, how can you defend it? 